Hello and welcome to another episode of Inside the Mind. This week, I had the pleasure of sitting down with someone who I consider a good friend, someone who is one of my biggest mentors and my biggest supporters. I've known Sylvan Gacy for 10 years now, uh, and he still has the same fiery energy that I first met him in. And he still supports and builds up those around him so, so much. And I hope he came through in today's podcast. We sat down for what I think to date is my favorite podcast. One, because it was incredibly authentic and it was very real. We covered a range of topics from gender-based violence issues in South Africa to his father's death, to his upbringing. And he shared some wisdom that I think would be of value to a lot of listeners in terms of applying it into your own lives. I really, really enjoyed today's podcast. So without further ado, let's go inside the mind. Siv and Gacy. Siv. Hey, man. Um, we've known each other, I think, now for 10 years. And in those 10 years, uh, we've, we've shared memories. We've shared masterclass subscriptions. But I've never, ever asked you about your childhood. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I bring it up is because, for me, childhood is like the foundations in which people become who they are. And there was a great quote that I came across the other day, which was that, in every soul, childhood is the only story that stands alone. So let's rewind the clock a little bit. Mm-hmm. What's your childhood story? You know, so it's good to see you. Uh, congratulations on everything you were doing. And uh, I remember when I first met you, you always had the same drive and hustle. And no, never ever sem- seemed like a, an option. Uh, even, when, <laughs> even when you invited me to that thing when you were young. Um, you know, for me, man, I think... I think a lot of people are always like, what is it about you? Like, what is your secret? And I'm like, I think my childhood is my secret, guys. Um, I, I had nothing. Uh, we were poor, but I had my mother's self-belief and grounding and values. And I think values are invaluable, absolutely invaluable. And I think people take them for granted. Um, my mother was just, I think we clashed a lot when I was younger because I never understood she was so strict. She was a principal. Uh, she tried to push us in Christianity. We had to go to church. Blah, 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 blah. But for me, it was the values and the, the, the self-belief that she instilled in me that now is just invaluable. Now I walk into a room and people are like, what is it with this guy? Either they say I'm arrogant, which I don't care, or they're like, oh, you're so confident. But I think it's just the values that my mother really did instill in me. Um, you grew up where? I grew up in Kuguletu. Uh, I moved to Langa and then Pylons and then now I live in town for the last 18 years. Um... But I just think it's just all about values. And I think my mother, we could be in Bristol, in London, and my mother was still giving me the same beatings that she was giving me in Kukuletu. Even though we were in Pylons, we're still eating the same food that we ate when we were in Kukuletu. Yeah. So my mother was just the most consistent human being ever. Two schools only. Even though she couldn't afford to have us in those schools, we were still in those schools. And it's just about values and consistency. And that's why for me, if I walk down the street and someone calls me a kafir, Right? The chance of me hitting him are slim to none. Because, mm, okay, cool, whatever, move along. It's not my really fight, really. But if someone disrespects me in ways that disrespects my, my fundamentals and the, the human that I am, or I see them or an injustice down the road, or I see someone calling someone else the K-word, there's a better chance of me going to move that person there because I like fighting against people's injustices. Me, I'm like, cool, you can... Yeah. I believe I'm great. I'm unapologetic about that unapologetically, like for example, when someone's racist towards me, I'm like, what? You don't like me because of the color of my skin. What? Oh, you're missing out on this incredible human. But if I see you racist towards someone else from a distance, if that's an injustice, I'll go head first. Is it because you saw a lot of injustice growing up? Yeah, I saw a lot of injustice growing up. I grew up in the township, man. The township is filled with injustice. Um, and I grew up, my, my grandmother had a Shabin. So I saw people fights. I saw injustices. My mother was sleeping in bedsides of perfect strangers who were dying at the Red Cross Hospital. Or I, I, I would have to go with my mother because my mother used to, used to drop me in the townships. When I lived in Pylons, they used to drop me in the townships uh, during the weekends. And every Sunday, I used to have to sit next to bedsides of perfect strangers. Just like, think to my mother, why am I here? We don't know this person. Why am I here? Why are you crying? We don't know this person. And then some days I would have to move out my room because my mother used to bring perfect strangers into our house. I'm like, I'm, 
I'm, now I'm sleeping on my sister's bed because, because you brought another stranger into our house. And as a kid, it used to bother the fuck out of me. I was like, oh, not another stranger. What do you mean we got groceries for Christmas and you took half of them and you gave them to someone else? As a kid, I was like, what do you, what do you mean that's what you're doing? You yeah. know? So that's why for me, you can attack me all you want, bro. Like you've seen me. Man. Attack me, call me every name in the book, whatever. But I see you doing to someone else. I'm going in with a flying head kick. Uh, yeah. It's something, a hit to the jaw or something. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's, that's me, man. And yeah. that's, that's because of my childhood. One of the things a lot of people don't know about me is when, <clears throat> before I was adopted one years old, uh, I was born in a township called Mpleni, mm -hmm. which is just outside, uh, outside of Cape Town. And I, I know a few people from there. And, and when, they, when I speak to, speak to them, you have like a, a juxtaposition in terms of the experience of the township. Mm. Some people say they really love the township because it gives you mm. a sense of community. Mm. And then, but obviously because of things you've already mentioned, mm. there's a lot of social economic mm. issues in the township. Mm. What is your like experience of the township? Is it entirely negative mm. or is there? You know, the township doesn't work well for you if you're really trying to be something great. Because a lot of the times they go, what do you mean? What do you mean you want to be great? You want to leave us behind? What? No, you think you're better than us, you know? And I think that's a big problem when it comes to townships. And for me, I was always that kid trying to be something big, you know what I mean? And I got put down a lot growing up. Oh, you think you're better than us? Oh, you're a coconut. Oh, you think you're better than us? I got a lot of that. But community, as you said, camaraderieship. I'm still back in the township every week, man. I love it. I, I go have meat there. I, I take my international friends there. I, I was doing a film now with John Boyego and um, um, Viola Davis. Took John to the township for meat. He loved it. So I lo the, the township, the fundamentals of who I am are all township. Yeah. Would I be as far as I am today if I still lived in the township? I beg to differ. I don't think I'd be who I am if I stayed in the township. What about going back then? Like, do you, do you do any like sort of work to like lift up the township? So for me, I don't believe in getting to the top and kicking away the ladder. I think that is fundamentally one of the worst things you can do when you succeed. Um, I have, um, I own a charity called the Menstruation Foundation. We distribute about 11,000 to 11,000 women packs of pads per month. In the next two months, we're doubling it to about 22,000. Um, by August, I want to have my, um, my 9 million rand factory up and running to be able to produce the Africa's cheapest sanitary pad, knocking it down to 350 for a packet of 10 and 175 for a packet of five. Um, never been done before. Uh, revolutionary stuff um, that will change, the, the, change what happens in townships because a lot of people now are having to pick between a loaf of bread and a packet of sanitary pads. So am I doing something back in the township? Yes, I am, man. Changing one life at a time. A lot of people on social media are all talk. It's all good to be a feminist online. It's all good to be the freedom fighter online. But all you're doing is typing words. Some of us are getting our hands dirty and that's what it's all about. Yeah. And I, I, I'm definitely, I want to talk more about that a little bit later on in, in the podcast. Um, the, so after the township, you go to uh, move to Pinelands or Langa first. So I went, I went uh, Google to, but my mother, I'm going to say something funny about my mother. Now I talk about my mother a lot. My mother, my dad was around, but they got divorced later on. But my mother even though we lived in the township, she believed we were better. We, we thought, my mom thought she was Oprah Winfrey. That's what they used to call her, Oprah Winfrey. They used to call her Winnie Mandela. She walked like she owned the world. Um, a bit of a classist my mom was. I must be honest. If I, now that I think my mom was a classist, my mom still is a classist. Yeah. Uh, my mother lives in Pylons. And if you respect my mother, but my mother would be like, listen, yeah, I'm up here, you're down there. Yeah. But she doesn't believe, it's so weird to call mother a classist and still say she's a good person. But my mother, honestly, categorically, always was like, we might be here with them, but we're better and we're going to get out of here. And even though we can't afford to get out of here, I'll never forget, I was in Pylons, bruh. Uh, like someone, I had a person come do shoot something in my house. I have like 150 pairs of shoes. Most of them are free. And I have like them on the wall. And they were like, why do you have so many shoes? I have so many shoes because when I was young, my mother used to, at the beginning of the year, school shoes. School shoes were used for formal events. Church, hated church, still hate church, hate religion. Mm. Um, they, they were used for church, everything formal, whatever. And then I had one pair of shoes that were like for something casual and then a flip-flop. I had to keep those going for the whole year. 
I remember sometimes wearing shoes and I used to feel the water coming through them. You know what I mean? But I was the cool kid, bro. I was the, I was Siv. I was cool, man. Yeah. And, but I, I pushed on to act like everything was fine. But now I have more shoes than I need. I have, I have shoes, some 10% of my shoes I've never worn. They never even wear shoes without socks because I don't wear them long enough for them to get dirty. But um, that's what it's all about, man. But for me, it's just about, I want to change lives. I want to change lives. Yeah. I, I'm competitive as fuck. I want to beat people at changing lives. I want to change more lives than most people can. I want to be iconic in changing lives. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and for me, that's what I'm all about. And, and, and for me, I think a lot of people in the feminist space, feminists don't want to compete in, in change. No. I want to compete in changing lives. Yeah. I want to be the biggest charity that the African continent has ever seen. Um, and I want people... I want people to wake up and look at me and go, not he's talented. I want people to go, who is this guy who's just like 36 and just wants to change the world and make it cool? When did you have, when did you start having this drive? Because like one of the things is you, people will pick up instantly about mm. you when they meet you mm. is there's like, there's like a fire in mm. you mm. and it's very evident. When did you realize you had that? Let me give you an example. So I told, so I met Hussein Bolt about six years ago. Yeah. Hussein Bolt. Met him at the 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 the, the JNB Met. He was there. He was there. He was there, and he was only letting women into his VIP because Hussein Bolt likes vagina. <laughs> and I saw his friend step out of VIP. I followed him to the toilet, right? His friend. And at the urinal, I said to his friend, "Pass the story on to Hussein. I don't have to go tell him myself. You tell him." I said. When I was younger, my mother used to save up money every four years to get Mnet. Every four years. Why every four years? So we can watch the Olympics. My mother used to sit us down during the Olympics. 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, those kind of races. She used to make us sit down and watch the Olympics. And she used to go, okay, 100 meter race. She'd be like, okay, cool. She's like, watch them at the back. They're rehearsing. They're getting ready. They're warming up. It's only going to be under 10 seconds, but it'll take them four years of training, their entire lives of sacrifice. My mother's like, commentate that these Olympics. Then they used to walk up. My mother like, look at them. The guy in the middle is the fastest, right? He doesn't have to look right and left. He looks straight. The person next to him is the one looking at him. Blah, 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 blah. He says, now they get down. Look how confident they are. Look who's the most confident. The chances of that the winner will come through the middle. My mother used to go through commentating these 100 meters. As a kid, to irritate the fuck out of me. I was like, just let me watch the 100 meter. Why are you commentating? She's like, now watch, on your marks, get set, go, boom, there's one, 10 seconds later. And then she used to go, now celebrate and tell them how great you are. Then those Americans used to be like, this is what I'm all about. I'm great, I'm godly, look at me, I'm great. My mother used to run around the house acting that shit out, bruh. That's, that's the shit I grew up in. But what you don't realize, and I told Hussein about that, I said, and that the friend, I said, my mom used to save up every single year. So during that month, we had Mnet, and then she would cancel it afterwards. The story went back to Hussein, right? I sat there and watched. Hussein went, <laughs> called me, opened VIP, went in, chilled with uh, Hussein Bolt, told him the story, and he was just like blown away. Yeah. And then, similar story, uh, last. The, the, the Jane B. Met, not Jane B. Met, the, the, the Queen's Plate. I saw um, Chad Leclo. I've seen him lots. He knows me, I know him. I walked up to him and I said, I watched you swim with my mother. And my mother, all my mother could do was scream, Unbelievable! Yeah, yeah, unbelievable! Unbelievable! He cried because he just realized the people that you, and my, the fundamentals of who I am and how competitive I am is because of my mother. Yeah. But growing up, it irritated them. It irritated me. The lesson she was there. Oh, I was like, let me watch. It's going to be 10 seconds. It's going to be painless. Another thing she used to make me do is watch pageants. Ah, oh, look how confident she looks. Oh, bikini. Not too good. Okay. All right. Question and answer. Oh, she's beautiful, but she's stupid. You know what I mean? And that's the kind of world. Y yeah. And you, you speak about your mom a lot. Um, and it's a, it's a cool relationship that you have that I've witnessed with your mom. Uh, why are you so close to your mom, do you think? You know, it, it's... <clears throat> we know we're not besties. I think everyone thinks we're besties. My mother and I aren't besties. 
but we're very close because I think growing up, she was always consistently struggling with me. Because I was this kid who went to the Model C school, we were mixed. So I challenged because I was taught to challenge at school. She taught me to challenge. So we clashed a lot. And growing older, she's like, oh, I just created a carbon copy of me. And that's all I was doing. But it was, it was difficult. It, it, let's be truthful and honest, guys. There's no, growth is painful. Yeah. And, mm. you, but you also like strike me as someone, and I wanted to talk to you about this, but you strike me as someone who has really good relationships with those around you. Like with your mom, I've seen. Mm. And then you also someone who looks like has a lot of friends. And I actually wanted to ask you if, I don't have a lot of if you have a lot of friends. I have acquaintances. You have a lot of acquaintances. And how how many friends do you have? Very small knit. The F word's a big word for me. Mm. Big word. The F word's a big word. People, uh, people under, overutilize the F word. Friend. Friend is huge, bro. Friend is, if I accidentally kill someone, I need to be able to call a friend to help me bury the person. And then only when we finish burying, I must be able to go, oh, what happened? That's the kind of friends I, that, that's what I call a friend. Everyone else, ah, guys, everyone else, ah, hi, hi, ah, no time for that. But my relationships are, are authentic, consistent, and real. How do you find that? How do you, how, how do you identify that? In I'm an acquired way? taste, bruh. I'm like anal sex, caviar, sushi, intestines, and hard work. Not everyone likes those things. But once you like them, you like them. And I said anal sex. I said anal sex. Because people who like anal sex love anal sex. You don't know. You don't. I don't mind anal sex. You don't say, I don't mind it. Mm -mm. You either all in or nothing. You know? Yeah. And that's me, man. I'm going to quiet taste. Uh, and I know it. I, there's no other way. I don't want it any other way. I, 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 don't, I can't have everyone liking me. I can't. A certain guest, he can't have everyone liking him. I'll never be able to. I'll never be great if everyone likes me. Mm. But that's from your perspective. How do you identify it in someone else? What do you look for? I don't I, think I would like, I don't think I would like someone who's like me. Okay. Uh, so I, you I, haven't got friends who are like, your friends of what very different sort of temperaments are there. I think, I think the people around me are either just like me in the sense of that. I think for me, I have friends of mine who are acquired tastes as well, but they're not as ambitious in your face as me. You know, there's different qualities that are similar. But the people who are closest to me are people that, that, that can balance out. Like, for example, I have female friends. I've got, I've got a big female squad that, that supports me, that I can listen. I, I learn. I learn a lot from women. Um, I'm a better man because of women. Uh, imagine this, this mess of a man without a big woman influence. I'd be, I'd be a mess. Yeah. And um, um, you, I, you brought up women. And this, mm. is like, this is a conversation I really, really want to talk to you about. And that is, you, you play a really big role in this country when it comes to gender-based violence mm -hmm. issues, at least on a, on a social media platform, mm -hmm. as well as also, you, have, you, you actually talk the, uh, walk mm -hmm. the walk as well. But um, there's, the first thing I want to talk about before we get into the other thing is, is the cancel culture side mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what your thoughts are, are on cancel culture in that, general. Well, the irony of it is that I hate cancel culture. Yes. Right? And then you're going to go, but you use cancel culture on your platform, which a lot of people do say to me. I, for me to post a picture of a man, for example, here's the perfect example. Three weeks ago, 12 women came forward about this guy. I won't mention his name. Actually, fuck him. Yeah, no, you can Dragon. Him. Dragon. His name was Dragon, yeah. right? Who consistently abused women, all these things. And if you're listening to this and you're a friend or a family, I actually wish you could try and take me to court. Because you know your friend, your son, your whatever was scum of the earth. And I don't regret what I did. I outed him on social media because many women came to, uh, forward. Women that I didn't know. But the night a woman who I knew came forward to me with evidence and everything, I, I posted the thing. He committed suicide after I posted. I feel nothing. I, fe I feel absolutely nothing. Right? I didn't kill him. I wasn't there. I didn't hang him. I didn't convince him to hang himself. And if you understood, if you understood mental health, no one makes you kill yourself. Yeah, it's a lot of facts. So if you're listening to this, two things can be right. Your friend was a scum, piece of shit, trash, bastard, and it is sad that he's dead. And that was not my intent. Two things can be right. 
Now, when I post someone, right, we need to be accountable for our actions. So if I ever did wrong, wronged a woman, post me. And if I'm innocent, we can go down and we can do the fight. So for me, I'm not telling you to cancel him. I'm telling you to go, if one day you Google Dragon, and his name comes up, it'll go convicted, um, accused of blah, 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 blah. And there's a red flag, right? But for me, cancel culture, it's quite, so, but I'm not, I'm not canceling him. I don't, you never see me say cancel the guy. I tell you, he's a piece of shit. He's done this, 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 this. And do you know, out of all the men that have ever accused of doing this, of out, not a single one, A, has had the balls to contact me. B, has ever filed any sort of um, um, lawsuit. lawsuit. What does that mean? Yeah, it's guilty. Uh, yeah. If someone said to me, I abused women, I raped women, uh, me, I'd be fighting there. Because I've been accused by a woman of sexual harassment. Do you know that? Many people don't know that. I've been accused by a woman of social harassment, right? And I went guns blazing, guns blazing. And even though I've been wrongfully accused, I still believe the woman first, always, until I'm proved otherwise. Yeah, because the reason why I agree with you is because of the context of this country. So I completely hold the same views with, your, mm. with when it comes to cancel mm. culture. Mm. Um, but I kind of feel like the only way that you, we're going to stop it is by taking these drastic measures. We've got it. But I'm wondering, outside of social media, mm. what can, else can be done? Let me tell you one thing. If you live in a country that a woman, a packet of pads is cheap. Let's say 10, 10 rand. If the government thinks that women aren't worth 10 rand, how are you even shocked when she gets gang raped by five men? Because she's worthless. She's worthless to society already. So when she's getting gang raped, you go, oh my goodness, it's horrific. And I'm telling you, no, go back. She wasn't worth 10 rand. And when I open my factory, she, it'll be three rand 50. So for me, I get pads on women, right? With my organization, which keeps them into, in school. When girls are actually at home, they've been targeted more because they don't go to school, then they get targeted by rapists at home. Big thing that happens. Big, 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 big. The big problem. So for me, it's about worth. I think people sometimes think of rape and this whole thing of just as a violent thing. This thing is systematic. It goes right to the bottom, guys. So if you're not, if you're calling your friend a bitch continuously, it's, the patriarchal system is showing up. Rapists aren't made overnight. It's years of programming. For me, I want to get involved in programs with friends. I want to get all my famous friends. I want to do tours around the country. In fact, could you imagine, could you imagine the, the, the ICC, 5,000 young boys from around the country, all matriculants. I get my friend Sia to do a talk. I get my Wade Fonikak to do a talk. I get Musi Mamani to do a talk. I travel around the country, getting boys, playing games, doing, like, doing things, man creating an army, then we have an app, an app that has two million young boys. You know, you can only be a boy to be on this thing. We communicate, we talk about games, you sign something that says, I am joining an army. And when you, join, when you sign that piece of paper, we're holding you accountable to your actions as a man. And if you're wrong, you're, you're off this app. And us to be able to build, making it cool, like, like, like Uber. Guys, which one of our guys our age is using a, a meter taxi? Everyone's using Uber. We need to be able to make accountability, being a good man, fashionable. You know? And that's what I think we've we got to do. We've got to get guys who speak like me, who swear, who are normal guys, who are wearing flipping tracksuit and a hat at an interview, and who are unapologetic to say they love their mother, who are unapologetic to say they love women, they love having sex, but they want to do it consensually, respectfully, and still be good men, bruh. Yeah. And I think we've got to change the language. The language is wrong. Hello. Uh, sorry to interrupt the podcast that you were enjoying with Civ. I wanted to give you a quick message from our sponsors today. We've all heard of Web3 by now, and we've all have heard about the craze around NFTs and the po possibilities that it gives us. One of the sponsors today is Moment. 
Moment is an NFT marketplace that enables creators to earn an income off the back of their work. What I love about Moment is that if you can think of it, Moment can facilitate it. All you need is a phone and an internet connection. Back to the podcast. We're not looking for perfect men. No, we're not. There's no such thing as a perfect man. If you're looking for a perfect man, find me a flipping perfect woman first. But what we're asking for is accountable men. That's what I'm striving for, is an accountable man. When you fuck up, you do better. You don't hang yourself. You, 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 you right to the wrongs that you did. You come out and you say, I fucked up, I messed up, I need to be better. And you apologize and you do better. Or if you need to go to jail, you go to jail, bruh. I think the fight just needs a different language change. It's got to be a you. It's got to be a me. There's two guys in here. The sound guy. It's got to be cool, everyday guys fighting. Yeah. And, and bro, here's another thing I want to uh, get. I shouldn't be getting so much attention for this. Do you know why I get so much attention? Because there's no one who looks like me doing what I'm doing. The only people who are doing what I'm doing are middle-aged men who no 18-year-old is going to listen to. That's why I'm getting attention. It's like, getting, it's like clapping for someone when they stop at the zebra crossing. I ain't stopping at a zebra crossing because I want to, bitch. And when I say bitch, I mean human in general. I ain't stopping at the traffic lights because I want to. I stop because I have to. And when you're outing a woman abuser, you should be getting patted on the back for it. It's what we sh all should be doing. I promise you, if women in this country had horns growing on their noses, they were getting cut every day for... Uh, Chinese, I promise you, women will be safer. I promise you, rhinos get more treat, a better treatment in this country than women. Yeah. Animals die with more dignity than women. At least these uh, animals who are dying in abattoirs for halal meat get prayed for before they die. They get given a nice treatment how they die. Women here are getting mutilated, cut up, killed, like, not even like animals, because animals, they're getting killed and, and cut up like cockroaches. Because for me, cockroach isn't an animal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you play a very big role in, in, in this. And you mentioned like the role of men in this. And mm -hmm. one of the things that like sticks out a lot to me is how you sort of tackle to toxic masculinity or just masculinity as well in general. Mm -hmm. You often break the um, sort of stereotypes mm -hmm. of what it is to be masculine because mm -hmm. you perform in drag um, as well as also you, you're a rugby player, water polo player, you do MMA. Provincial, provincial. Right? <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <stunt>. <laughs> I don't work hard, but I'm provincial, dog. MMA. I fight boxing. I've had five fights. I spar with professionals. They can't touch me. I outwalk women in heels. I'm one of the top rated uh, pole dancers in the country, internationally and locally. What, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to redefine masculinity? Or is, ma yeah, what, what are you trying to achieve? Okay. You know what I'm trying to achieve? <laughs> I get articles written about me about trying to break the gender norms and masculine breaker. Do you know what I'm trying to do? Redefine, reword, re-understand, reimagine what masculinity means to me. I just have a platform that I can share it on. I'm not trying to change perceptions, bruh. I want to be the best pole dancer. I want to be the best drag artist. I want to walk, like for example, after I finish this, I'm going to try running on a treadmill on my, in my heels, just create content. But this is a personal journey, my, my chums. This is a personal journey. I'm not trying to be the Nelson Mandela of masculinity. I promise you I'm not. The perception is that I am. It's just that I have a platform. Okay. There are many, many, many men out there doing way more than me who have less of a platform. You know, I just want, and now that it's out there, I want the five-year-old, the six-year-old, the seven-year-old, the 10-year-old who's at home wearing dresses in heels, looks on his profile and he goes, but this guy, Uncle Siv, he, he boxes and he's masculine and ladies like him and he wins bodybuilding competitions, but he wears a dress. That means I'm fine, you know? Yeah. Can I tell you the biggest lesson I've learned? I have a, a, my friend's son, his name's Sankakara. He's four years old. I, took, I take him out, even last week, I take him out to buy toys. Sanka only likes girls' toys, inverted commas. He's four. Walks into the store three days ago. Uncle Thiv, I want that toy, Uncle Thiv. 
It's a big head of a Barbie doll. Long hair. Got that one that Uncle Fiv. He, he's got a lisp. Um, I think he did to Uncle Fiv. He never at one at any moment asks, is this fine to take this toy because it's a girl toy? Because he knows he's safe here. Buys a crown, whatever, 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 whatever. We'll take it home. Sanka is my biggest lesson of masculinity. I am not the less. I am me. I am not the person people should be learning from. Sanka, who is four, who goes into Toys R Us, sees a flipping baby there, toy there, and he takes it and grabs it. Go to flipping McDonald's. Sanka, what do you want? I want a Happy Meal. What toy do you want? I want a girl toy. Why do you want a girl toy? Because it's pretty. You giving credit to a 36-year-old as, as I get is a lot of bullshit. I'm 36. I'm a man. I'm flipping straight. And what I, no one's going to try to hurt me. Some people who wear dresses and heels in townships get killed. So I shouldn't be getting credit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sanka should be getting credit. Those who walk down wearing heels in townships should be getting credit. Because no one's going to fuck with me. I wish a person would fuck with me. I wish. I'm ready. I'm ready. You know what I mean? And even that is toxic masculinity zone. Because me, I speak fluently with my fists, which is a big contradiction. You know what I mean? Sanka needs the credit. He's four. He's unapologetically himself. Flipping, strong little, three little guy. Loves to touch, loves to feel. But he loves girls' toys. Does it mean he's gay? No. Likes pretty things. You open up your, yourself to a lot of criticism. Oh, more than enough. How, like, how do you deal with that? Because you are constantly being told, Siv, why are you doing this? Siv, stop doing that. Siv, she shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know something. If you could, I wish people could measure the self-belief I have in myself. I, I wish you could put it on a Richter scale. I, I think you would struggle to get on a Richter scale. Um, the, the only thing I can explain is that I am a lion uh, and a lion doesn't care what sheep think. Uh, I'm an eagle. I don't fly with pigeons and dogs only bark at moving cars, never parked ones. Um, I, I, I do me, man. I do me. That's all I can do. Uh, and, and the rest is irrelevant to me. Yeah, when you speak of self-belief, like what's the difference for you between like arrogance and confidence? Ah, great question. Ah, you know what the difference between arrogance is? And arrogance is a person who puts him or herself before others at all times. I repeat, arrogance is when someone puts himself or themselves or themselves or herself before everyone at all times. The only thing that is bigger, the only thing that's as big as my ego is my heart. When my ego becomes bigger than my heart is the day I know I have a problem and that it becomes, uh, that becomes uh, egotist that I'm egotistical. But I do have an ego, but my ego is as big as my heart. So I don't put myself before others. Okay. Sounds like, I hope I explained that correctly. If you didn't understand that, for sec, <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Um, then, then sort of like, um, I have like a few, like sort of like, a, let's call them deeper questions. Yeah, yeah, go right. deep. That's what you said. Um, the one yeah. is, because one of the things I, I got asked a lot by people is like, when you, when you have guests here, like I'm so sick of hearing about this, and this is them speaking. I'm so sick of hearing about hearing all the successes, how oh. amazing their lives are. Agreed. And, and like life's not like that for everyone. No. And like happiness, for instance, is not like a constant state of being. Mm -hmm. It's it's a temporary mood, mm -hmm. right? So um, I want to know about an event in your life, which was your your father passing. Mm -hmm. That was that happened in the trick. If I'm not yeah, yeah, in the in the matric. Yeah. And you spoke in an interview. Uh, I think you may have been with Anelia or someone, or Times or someone. But you mentioned basically that it was a very tough time in your life. You had, uh, mm. Acne came out. Mm. How did you overcome that? Now, my dad died 2004, car accident, uh, first of spring. Uh, but I was lucky that he had a car accident Friday the 13th, somewhere in August, and died about two, three weeks later. Um, bro, you have no choice, bro. Like, I think sometimes you don't, we have no choice but to, to get back up. I still had to write my matric exams. Um, it was difficult, man. Acne came out, huge flipping pimples coming up my face. Um, self-conscious about it, but I had to overcompensate by being this big character. Um, no, man, it could have broken me. Could have broken me, but ended up becoming one of the best things that happened to me. I'll tell you why I say that. Um, I became the man of the house. 
my mother, my dad left me, I think it was 230,000 rand or something, something flipping. If you think about it now, I think it's little money, like little money. But what I was able to do is use that money to be able to live a life while I was trying to build a career. I didn't use the money to build my career. I used it to be able to sustain me while. And I think if, he had, if that hadn't happened, I think I would have ended up being either an unsuccessful entertainer or I'd have taken another nine to five. And then what if someone calls you privileged for that? I'm not privileged. I'm not privileged. I, I, yeah. I, 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 work, I, I work too hard, man. Okay. 200,000 200, 200, bucks, if you think about it, in the greatest scheme of things of inheritance, it's fuck all. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's my, my dad had a, uh, a work thing. He died in a car accident, a road accident fund nonsense. Um, but it's not privilege. I was lucky. But when I say lucky, yeah. I had to, my dad had to die for it. Bro, if, if I could have my dad back for 250,000 rand, ah, ah, I could, I could pay you now. <laughs> Six of those right now if you want. And now, I'll swipe now. Yeah. You know, to get my dad back. Yeah, right now, I'll swipe. I'll EFT now. I'll give you EFT. <laughs> So if people tell me privilege by losing my father, no way, that's not privilege. Yeah, because no, the only reason I think about that is that I know for a fact someone thinks, oh, I want to pursue my career. I want to pursue my dreams. Mm. But Sylvan Gacy had 230,000 rand to be able to do so. But I lost my fucking dad. Yeah. Uh, can I actually wait a minute? I am gigantically privileged. I'm privileged to come out of the vagina of my mother. I'm privileged that my mother, that, that I was the fastest sperm in my dad's balls. That's a privilege I have had. And I'm privileged because I was able to believe in myself and I'm privileged because I took the chances that I had. If you want to bitch and moan, bitch and moan, bruh. But I don't feel like, I'm not the kind of guy who goes work harder. No, bruh. Let's be truthfully honest. Mm. Working harder is not the answer to everything in life. You, gotta, you need luck. You need, um, you need to work smart. You need to work hard. You need to be, no, I, I was privileged to come out of my mother's vagina. That's the privilege that I had. What, and what if it didn't work out? Was that even an option? Failing, you know, failing is a uh, part of life. Eh? I failed a lot. I'm still going to fail. Like as I sit here now, I'm busy waiting for my phone to ring for these four jobs that I'm up for. And I, I may not get any of them. Um, I am the kind of guy, I love sweets. I can wake up and eat a packet of jelly babies in the morning. So I'm quite excessive. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I've got an addictive personality. So I think if I had failed hard, I would have failed very hard. Like hard, hard. When I say hard, hard, I think I would have been, I could have been, I could have been a bum in the street. But in my mind, I would have believed I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, even though I was dirty. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a, there's a question that I quite like always asking people is that, do you consider yourself afraid? One, just as a caveat before my question. What? Do you consider yourself afraid of anything? Yes, I'm afraid of rats. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Um, I am afraid. I don't, I, I don't care for people's opinions of me, but I do not like being misunderstood. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't mind what you think of me, but make sure if you don't like me, you make sure you understand exactly what I meant. Don't misquote me, right? I think I fear being misunderstood, you know? And I think it's easy to misunderstand me. I think it's, uh, I think it's easy. In the common ways, you, I think you've already alluded to it earlier in the podcast, but in the common ways you're misunderstood. I think I'm brash. I think I'm short. Um, and I think my passion sometimes comes across as, I think I'm better than you, but I don't. I, I don't think I'm better than people. Um, could I have been, I could be further. I could be further in my career if I didn't care to help others. I think I could be further in my career if I wasn't so outspoken. I think I'd be further in my career if I wasn't so controversial. Really? Mm -hmm. Why do you say that? I think, I think, I think if, I think they're brands who want to work with me so badly. I think they're brands who really want to do stuff with me, but they're scared because I'm, I'm, because I'm volatile. That's so interesting to hear because from the outside looking in, that's not what it looks like at all. Mm. It seems like every brand under the sun wants to work with Sylvan Gacy because Sylvan Gacy is family friendly, female friendly. So, so Woolworths. Woolworths, I have friends of mine at Woolworths. They say my name comes up at every single 
campaign. As you serve and guess, he, like he's, he's, he's the future of masculinity. And then one person says, but he's volatile. I cannot be controlled. I will not be controlled. You know what I mean? Like, like for example, I've started these confessions on my timeline and a brand messaged me offering me big money. Let us give you half a mil and we'll put our branding on your confessions. Half a mil, bruh, just for Insta story. It's, it's easy. But I refuse to lose my, authentic, my authenticity. That would lose me my authenticity. And I refuse. Yeah, it can't be bought. And if you can't be bought, that's when they struggle with you, man. So I'd make more money and I'd be further if I was more palatable. What is a life well lived for you? Ooh. So I don't believe in religion, right? So I don't believe in hell. But my definition of hell is meeting the man I have the potential to become. And I'm laying on my deathbed and I'm about to die. And this man comes to me and goes, hey, I'm the sieve that you had the potential to become. If you had just worked harder, worked smarter, taken every opportunity possible. Yeah. That's my definition of hell. My definition of living a fulfill, fulfilled life is being the guy that comes to me to meet me and me laying down there with the same guy. Okay, because there was a very interesting thing that I just got reminded of now. Gary V says he has, a, he has this feeling, if heaven exists, mm. that there's a Google search button. And you go in and you, and you go through St. Peter's mm. gates and you say, St. Peter, I want to know the time I nearly died. Search. Mm. And it tells you the time you nearly died. But that's what freak me out the most. Is it's exactly, that's actually my fear as mm. well. I share the same fear as you, is literally knowing that had I done this, mm. had I done that, mm. I could have ended Imagine up Imagine meeting him. And this, is, and, and this is what I struggle with a lot because mm. I get critiqued a lot because I am so daring in what I do. Like I will fucking quit a law job because I want to go be a, an entrepreneur and I want to go do a tech startup. I will say no to working at this company because I want to be a podcaster, or I want mm. to do acting or whatever. And because I live in fear of being on my deathbed one day and saying, I didn't do enough. Yeah, bro. Right. So I want to ask you if someone is sitting there, because I, I, I don't always think mine in the way is the right way of, of doing it. There's no right way. There's no right way. There's no right way. Right if I'm sitting there, I'm someone listening, I'm stuck in my dead end job. I want to be whatever. Oh, what, what's your advice to them? Well, if you hate your job, do something about it. I, 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 and there's no other way. But, and, but and, Sip, and, 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 and his, and his excuse is going to be, but I have kids. Yes. I have a nine to five. Yes. I need to produce my, I had to, but they're 24 hours in a day. You work for eight hours, right? You can have a side hustle. Start your side hustle and your side hustle can be your main hustle. Do you think I just, for me, people do side things. Yeah. Me, I act, I do comedy, I present, I produce. You know what I mean? I, I, I just jump around. So I have side hustles. So I just, I just, you know, for me, it's the same as when I, when I people go, oh my God, Seth, I love seeing you do pole dancing, but I could never do it. My upper body strength is just not good enough. Do you think I walked up my mother's vagina hanging on a pole? It was difficult for me. It's still difficult for me. There's days when I fall off the pole. There's days when I hit my head. There's, it's, but you'll get better and better. So for me, there's, people always have excuses. If you want to side hustle, right? If you want to change your job, you have eight hours. You could put on another four and do a side thing. If you have a phone, you could start. If you want to be an actor, you have a, you have a cell phone, you can start something. If you want to podcast, you can start something. There is no excuses. Yeah. You, there's no excuses not to be happy, guys. I'm so sorry. Like, the only excuse for you not to be happy for me currently is mental health. You know what I mean? Awesome. Let, let's, no, no, no. I, I take that back. You know, happiness is not a constant. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. It's all right not to be okay. It's not all right not to want to be okay. And I repeat that again. It's okay not to be okay. It's not okay not to want to be okay. Yes, shit is bad. Yes, we've, people have died. Yes, it's been a tough two years. But do you want to be better? Or are you stuck in your rut and you don't want to be better? Now, if you're listening, you're going, oh my God, I have depression. Oh my God. Yes, I understand that. But even as you're struggling with depression, do something to fix it. And if you're doing nothing, then fuck you. 
Come on, man. Come on. You know what I mean? And if you're sitting there and you're a therapist and you disagree with me, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're sitting in a hole in your, if you're sitting in a hole, and you're going, life sucks, life sucks. And you're not trying to be on medication. You're not seeing a therapist. You're not talking to anyone. Then you deserve to be in that corner. I'm sorry. If you don't like your life, change it. And if you have other responsibilities, try a side hustle. And if you disagree with me, it's my opinion. I'm sticking to it. Six, uh, three months ago, two months ago, uh, I tried to do comedy. Well, it wasn't, I didn't try. I did comedy. You did comedy. People, you. people laughed. Yeah. Um, and I'm very proud of myself for doing that because it was one of the things on my bucket list. Mm. But I sat there afterwards because I was like, because you get a rush from being on stage, man. It's a drug. It is. Wow. Um, mm. I, can't, can't, I wanted describe. to go back the next it's, week. It's like you're about to, it's like you're about to pretty much ejaculate. Genuinely. I and think, you, I think it was when you're on there, you, you, you are ejaculating for 15 minutes. I, I, think, you're just like, I genuinely <laughs> thought, think it's and they better than like, sex. <laughs> now you know how it feels to be a woman. Just continuous, continuous coming. Just <laughs> coming and coming and going. Yeah. No, I, and the funniest thing is I completely agree with you. It's, you can I tell you what it feels? I've had five fights boxing. There's no way to describe how it feels when they call out your name and you run out to that flipping ring. It's, it's the same as comedy. What you're saying? Yeah, but I was saying is managing your brand mm -hmm. is a big thing because you, you said you mentioned all those, those side hustles. Mm -hmm. Side hustling is a bit different in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. in the sense that you it could change your brand so quickly mm -hmm. being associated with something else. And that was what was, I was worried about. It's so funny. Yesterday, I Googled, if you Google me, if you Google me, the second picture of me is of me in drag. The second picture. The third picture, maybe the second picture. It just, it's just drag, pole dancing. It just now, if you're trying to make me a leading man and you Google me without knowing my brand, I'm fucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought about it yesterday. If you Google me, maybe the second or third picture, Sylvan Gacy, second or third picture is me as a woman. You know? That's a side thing. But authenticity, it's me. Yeah. Take me or leave me. Because that's what I was worried about. I was like, do I want to be known as a comedian? Because what, I don't really think I'm that funny on a natural, on a normal level. Protect, do it. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me tell you something. Don't protect your career before you have one. Yeah. Don't protect your career before you have the career that you really want. Yes. You know what I mean? And do you know, do you know what the most important word in the entertainment industry is? It's no. That's no. <laughs> People think the most important word in this entertainment industry is yes. No, it's no. So this 21-year-old girl asked me, we were driving up to um, Durban for, to shoot a film, and she said to me, can you give me any advice? I said to her, the most important word in this industry is no. She goes, what do you mean? So I tried to make it get into her home. I said to her, treat the industry like your vagina. You say no more than you say yes. And when you say no... And then you finally say yes. If you do say yes, the yes is important. But if you say the yes to every single dick who wants to get inside your vagina, it would be a problem for you, you know? And this is what this industry is about. Say your no's. If you can't do a job, it doesn't feel like it's right, say no. If someone brings me a million rand and there's a job that I want to do that's 250,000 rand, my agent knows that I'll pick 250,000 rand. I'll say no to the million. And I've done that many a times, right? But no is the most powerful word in this industry. If you say yes to everything, if you say yes to every single offer, ah, you, you'll never get to where you're supposed to get to. Ah, you'll never. Ah, you'll never. I, saw, I did radio. Radio. I did radio for a while. And they were like, are you going to be drive time, whatever? And I realized, no, this isn't me. Yeah. And I wouldn't be happy. Yeah. What, what are those, some of the things going on in your life this, at the end of this year? Or the finishing off this year? Guys, COVID has changed the way, man. You sitting there are thinking... Everything's still booked and busy. I'm busy, but it's changed. I'm not, I'm not busy in the distance anymore. I used to be busy in the distance. I used to be booked up a year in advance. What COVID has done is made people go month by month. I don't know what I'm doing in August, bruh. I don't know what I'm doing in July. I don't know what I'm doing mm. in June anymore. I, okay, I'm going to New York, but it's changed now. It'll be on your toes. Different. It's really different. It's really, really, really different. I promise you so, it's so different. You're going to promote your new movie? Uh, no, no. I'm going to have a wedding and some meetings in June. Then I've got promotion on your film in all September and, 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 and what, October. What is it like working with Viola Davis? Is this, is this your biggest 
Is this your peak? Not think, your peak, but no, no, not no. To, I suggest that there's potentially not no, nothing no. above. But is this so no, far the peak? I think this is big, man. I think this this film's big. I think it's um Verity Fair said they 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 um they predict nine to twelve Oscar nominations, right? Um not me, I'm saying, but um it's big, man. It's big. And it's 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 the irony of it is that it's I play a character who starts off as this man who's against these women, this woman army, and then eventually I, I join them. He's an ally. You know what I mean? Hmm. But yeah, man. But currently my career is, COVID has turned it on his head. Usually by now, my whole November's booked up for corporate season. Yeah. yeah. I, I, up to December 15th. And then I usually used to fly overseas for three weeks and just cause trouble overseas and just take a holiday. But now... I can't book anything in advance anymore. I can't do anything in advance. Yeah. Siv, I want to say thank you. Sure, man. It's for your time. Thanks for letting us inside, inside your mind. Yeah, man. Uh, but I just want to say for you, um, yeah. I, love, I love the passion you have. I have. I'll always back you in everything that you do. I love the unapologeticness. Um, sometimes you, I, I see you and I'm like, you know, you definitely, will definitely will always have the kind of backlash that I've had in the sense of self-belief. I think you're a, you're a quieter version of me but the belief is the same. And for me, just remember, just keep on pushing, man. It's, it's, it, this, the, there's possibilities and there's an industry out there that you can do and just do it. And for me, I'll do anything for you. You know that. I, Thank you, bro. I back you. I know, and I appreciate that deeply. And it's, and it's true. Yeah. And, it's and, true. and for me, another thing, you know, the only hero you should have is the man you have the potential to become. Yeah. So Matthew, Matthew McConaughey says it really you'll well. You'll never well. meet him. Oh, you'll never ever meet this guy. Yeah. Ah, you'll never meet him. Just keep going. And one day when you die, you will, you'll know to meet him. But yeah, man, thanks a lot.